So I work on the storage side of things on TyKV. And prior to this, I used to work for Oracle on MySQL. And I was the lead on InnoDB. And uh, recently, I joined ThinkApp. And uh, my experience is limited, but uh, I do work on the storage side of TyKV. And this is my colleague, Andy. He's been working longer on TyKV. And so he'll take it from here. And we'll talk about uh, you know how we make TyKV more cost effective. And Yep. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Andy. Uh, I'm a software engineer of PinCap, and uh, I work on TIKV. Um, prior to PinCap, I worked for Google Spanner team, um, and so here I am. Um, our topic today is about like, making TIKV, our distributed uh, storage engine, more cost effective on the cloud. So. Uh, here's the agenda. Um, at first, I'm going to give you like a brief overview of TIKV. And then I will share you some of our own experience building a cloud service. And uh, yeah, that's it. And uh, then last, I will give you some examples like how uh, we do like cloud cost effective works. Um, and as well as some like works we're, we're, we're doing and will, will be done in the future. Uh, so first, uh, what is TyKV? So TyKV is an open source uh, distributed, distributed and uh, um, transactional key value store. Um, so it's written in Rust program, programming language from day one, uh, around like seven years ago. So we were so glad we made the right decision and it, it was a tough decision to make. Um, and since as Kubicon and uh, CNCF uh, conference, uh, I'm honored to mention that um, PinCap donated TIKV to CNSF Foundation like uh, three years ago, and now as a graduated product of CNSF. And I give the link uh, below. That's uh, our GitHub link. You can search it online. So, you know, TIKV as a storage engine has been um, globally adopted by many users in many different scenarios. So uh, here are some examples. Um, you know, we are infrastructure for infrastructure uh, in some cases, like there's a file system called JuiceFS. They use TIKV as their like metadata storage. And the, the GD Cloud uh, object storage also used us as their metadata storage. Um, so there's also like a blockchain company ca called like Harmony. Harmony, they use TIKV uh, to store the blocking data as well. Uh, I guess it's probably the super super node or something. Um, um, I'm not sure like whether you guys play mobile games or not, but uh, I guess you know like Pokemon Go uh, and the company behind Pokemon Go, Niantic, they use TIKV as a like transactional key, key value store. Um, so you know we are open source uh, product, so we have a large community. And like many community members did a lot of great things like around TyKV. So they built a Redis protocol on top of TyKV. And they're called like Tidys and uh, Titan. Uh, and of course, like PinCap as a company, um, we provide uh, like a, a, a solution, uh, uh, like a query uh, SQL, uh, MySQL compatible database that is called TIDB. That's our main product. And, uh, it uses TIKV as an underlying storage engine. So yeah, this is a, like an overview of TIKV architecture. So data in TIKV is partitioned into multiple shards, and each shard is like replicated across uh, multiple nodes, and a rough algorithm is used to maintain um, the consistency between replicas. Um, so here, like. Uh, a region, you can consider it like a rough group. Uh, I know it's a terrible name. Some, some people like um, make um, misunderstanding the, like m misunderstanding this with the cloud regions, but this is a, a rough region, a rough group. Um, and you know, like uh, in addition to raw KV uh, APIs, we also provide uh, transactional APIs. And the trans uh, transaction implementation 
we use, uh, it's called Percolator, and there's a paper about it, and you can search it online. Um, so through this architecture, TIKV like, scales to petabytes of data effortlessly. And you know, more importantly, um, all those scaling, uh, rebalancing works, and it's all done by TIKV itself automatically. So in case you are curious, and, and if we zoom out the archi uh, TIKV architecture a little bit, uh, here's the TIDB architecture, uh, the whole system. So as I mentioned before, um, TIDB is a query, query engine uh, and sitting on top of the uh, storage. Um, and similarly, we also have like another query engine called TI Spark. So you can write some Spark uh, like commands or query uh, like using Spark um, syn syntax. Um, and on the side, we have a component called placement driver. Uh, that's sort of like a centralized service to store some of the metadata of our system. And you know, uh, there's a new thing in our system that is called TI Flash because TIKV is a raw, like the uh, old uh, role-based storage engine. So it's aiming for like OLTP workload. Uh, and there are more and more customer um, like um, one like OLAP uh, system. And so we built a component for that scenario that is called TIFLASH and is uh, in column-based um, uh, data structure. So TIKV or TIDB can be uh, b deployed both on prem and on cloud. Uh, you know, like actually many of our bank users, like big bank users, they prefer to deploy TIKV on their data center and TIDB on their data center. Um, I mean, um, it's okay, but I have to say it's hard to, to support them because like when anything happens, we have to go to their place to do some work. Uh, it's not a scalable solution. Well, the good side of, uh, of this is that, so they're very rich, you know, those big customers, they're very rich, so they don't care about cost very much. Uh, they give us the, the hardware and we use it and like they, they don't ask any questions about like, um, uh, do you have some room left? Uh, is the resource enough or not? Yeah. Uh, well, um, but now our focus is cloud. Um, so, you know, uh, we're a cloud native database. So, uh, by the way, uh, we are deployed on cloud using Kubernetes. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar with uh, how familiar you uh, are you with the Kubernetes, but uh, where we use Kubernetes operator pattern to deploy our product. Um, so the good thing about cloud is it's a more scalable business, especially for ourselves. Uh, but you know, uh, when we provide our service as like um, software as a service on cloud, we have to care about the uh, like cost and the resource and efficiency, uh, all those things. You know, like everything um, is not free. Uh, on cloud, right? Um, so you have to pay for the computational resources like virtual machine and EC2 instances, uh, instance, and you also need to pay for the storage. And um, you know, like for example, the EBS, you're, you're not only paying for the space, you're also paying for the uh, number of IOs um, and uh, like a bandwidth, uh, something like that. And you know, um, if, you build, if you have experience building a service on cloud, uh, you will know that uh, there's like a diff uh, price difference uh, between cross region traffic, cross zone traffic, and local tra uh, network traffic. So there's many things like specific on cloud. So what we can do to reduce the cost or make the resource more efficient? Uh, so here are some examples I can think of. Uh, so for example, like uh, at the business level, you can do some saving plan because you know if you do your budget planning ahead, you'll get a discount, <laughs> just like uh, like a regular uh, normal normal life. Um, and the technical level, um, there are much more works we can do, like operational work. Uh, so if we can reclaim or shrinking down uh, the unused resource, we save a lot of money. 
Um, but in this talk, in our talk today, uh, I w mainly want to focus on like architectural changes uh, and optimizations that we did, um, uh, like to our main component, which is attacking. So on the right here, you can see like a resource analysis of uh, TI KV or TIDB on cloud. Um, uh, like 75% 75, 75 of the like budget goes to like EC2 instance, for example. Um, so how how can we uh, like make the resource more efficient, right? Um, so for computational uh, resource, we we can in general we can write like more efficient code. <laughs> that, that that's the most effective one probably, uh, but. We can also like uh, do some uh, work like uh, reducing the unnecessary process, uh, and for storage, uh, we can um, like we can have a system with a smaller size. We can um, reduce the number of IOs or have like a storage service storage service with less uh, or with a smaller bandwidth. And for network, uh, like. Like I mentioned before, they have different uh, like price difference. Uh, so we want to reduce a long distance traffic as much as we could. So first, computational efficiency. Uh, as mentioned before, uh, we use raft algorithm uh, for data replication, uh, or uh, more specifically, uh, multi raft. Uh, that means uh, each raft group stores a piece of data. And the whole data set of Thai TV is stored by many raft groups. So I'm sure that uh, you, know, you can imagine uh, inside each raft group, uh, all the peers, they have to communicate with, with each other to make sure they are in sync, right? And this process is called uh, heartbeat. You don't need to uh, know like, more details about it, but you, I'm sure you can understand this, the heartbeat. Uh, so, well, if you go with the naive, uh, implementation of Raft, you will find it not super efficient. Why? Because uh, when the data set uh, like be becoming large, um, and there will be like millions of Raft groups in your system. Uh, and well, in reality, you know, like uh, most of the uh, like most of the uh, groups store code data, right? So what we can do is really to put in those in inactive groups into sleep. So, and we call them uh, hibernated regions internally. So by doing this, we were able to greatly save a lot of CPU resources and, you know, uh, at, of course, uh, some network uh, as well. So that's what first thing we did, like optimizing the multi raft process. Um, second, um, you, know, you know, I see many of you guys like use MacBook, uh, so probably running Apple M1 or M2, uh, and I have a laptop, laptop uh, which is running on uh, Apple M2. Um, so you, you, you all know that the power of ARM, uh, the new, like not new, but like the, the other uh, CPU architecture. Um, so, you know, like we have been uh, trying to migrate our service from like uh, x86 to ARM. And our testing uh, shows that by using ARM, we can save like around 20% of the budget, but achieve the same level of performance. Uh, of course, right? Uh, so if the performance is not the same, it's pointless. Uh, that's about like computational resource. And next is about storage efficiency. So here is a graph showing you like uh, the life of a write in TechAV. Um, so we just talked about the hard heartbeats uh, j like just now, and that's more like uh, the raft core, and this is more like uh, the raft application. So uh, we can also divide the whole process into three steps. Um, so a request is coming uh, to the leader of the raft group, and the leader replicates the ra uh, raft log uh, to its followers, and then all the followers will like uh, persist the raft log in their local uh, storage engine, uh, and we call it like raft um, storage. And then there will be another like process called uh, log applying process. And they will fetch the log from uh, the local raft storage and do some processing and then put the real user data into the real user, uh, real user data storage engine. So, uh, 
uh, I guess like we can tell that there are mainly two types types of I/O here, right? One being the rough log, and the other one being the real user data. So we will discuss them separately. So first. Uh, let's see what we can do here uh, to the real user data um, pro uh, step. So, you know, on each node, TechEV, like on a single node, TechEV uses RocksDB as a local storage engine. Um, RocksDB is a LSM tree structure implementation. Um, and the LSM tree structure looks like this, roughly. Um, so, a write coming to a LSM tree will be put into both the memory table, which sits in the memory, and as well as the Red Hat log, which sits in the disk. And like when the memory table goes beyond a certain limit, it will be flushed into the disk, uh, like uh, in sorted string table, SSD. Uh, well, you, you know, if the engine crashes, there will be some data in the memory table, mem table, and they will be lost, right? Uh, and that's the time when the Red Hat log kicks in. So the recovery process will read the log and reboot the map table. So it's a, this is like a typical uh, LSM tree imp implementation. Well, in reality, you know, in our system, rough log like actually plays the same role uh, as a Red Hat log, uh, like native Red Hat log of RocksDB. So in our case, you know, uh, what we can do is instead of using uh, the native Red Hat log of RocksDB, we can just use uh, Ruft, Ruff log. Um, so, you know, this optimization is actually kind of like a no-brainer. Uh, you may ask me, like, why didn't we do this at the first place? Uh, I will tell you, like, two reasons, uh, one truth and one lie. Um, so first reason is um, using RocksDB native uh, Red Hat log, we can get faster recovery time. And the second reason is we don't have the main power. <laughs> you can guess which one is choose which one is why. Um, okay, that's about like real user data uh, stuff. And um, as for the ref log, you know, in the past actually uh, we store both user data and ref log. Uh, in the same RocksDB instance. So, um, you know, RSM tree or RocksDB, in general, uh, they have a like, better read performance um, uh, comparing to B-tree. Well, uh, RSM tree structure usually needs some background activity to do some work, you know, to make sure the read being performant, and that's called compaction. And there's like a well-known problem of this process. Uh, it's called read amplification, because uh, you know um, you flush the data from the memory table to a sort of string table, and there will be like a lot of uh, files uh, sit in the disk. And sometimes you have to merge them together, like read them, uh, load them uh, to, uh, into your memory, and then um, merge them together and write, write back to the disk. So. Uh, like one single, like one single entry will be read into the disk multiple times because of this process, that, and that's called write amplification. And you know, but one uh, character rough log has is uh, they are coming in strict sequential order. So in, what does uh, what that means is that we don't really need uh, the merge functionality or the compaction functionality of LSM tree. In this case, um, so we wrote our own uh, like a new storage engine. We call it uh, Raft Engine. Oops. Yep. So. Through Ruft Engine, we were able to reduce the total number of I/O by like 20 to 40 percent. That that was a, like a huge win for us. Yep, that's about the I/O. So, for a network, you know, like as mentioned, cross-region traffic and cross-room traffic are significantly higher than local network traffic. So, you know, our works here are mostly about reducing the long-distance traffic. Um, so, 
TIKVN or TIDB as a distributed system, uh, we usually deploy the whole system in different geog uh, geographical areas and uh, scatter the replicas, uh, like one replica per zone. Uh, you know, if that's the case, if by, like, by default there's no much room, we can uh, improve this process because uh, we have to replicate the data, right, at least once. Uh, but again, uh, in reality, some of the users, uh, they have one, uh, more than one replica in the same zone. Uh, a typical use case is, uh, as mentioned, uh, we have a new component, type flash, so that sometimes they deploy a type, fla uh, type flash in addition to type KV in the same zone. So in this case, you, you know, if we don't do anything about it, uh, this two replica will like may try to gather uh, own data from the leader, uh, which is in another zone, right? Um, so obviously we can optimize that. So instead of uh, like getting data um, from the leader uh, at the same time, we can force the second replica in the same zone um, to get the data from the first one, right? Just copy the data across zones once. And similarly, uh, the same principle can also be applied to the reflow as well. Uh, so uh, like one sentence, uh, yeah, like read locally as much as possible. Uh, but this requires uh, utilizing the follower read functionality uh, and provided, which is provided by um, MVCC, which is like multi-version concurrency control plus rough algorithm. Uh, give you just, here's like a summary. Um, so um, for a computational resource, uh, we optimize it by uh, optimizing the multi raft heartbeat flooding problem. And while we're also uh, able to reduce the cost by using ARM. And for storage, we write our own raft, uh, uh, raft log engine called, it's also open source. And using that, gives us like, uh, like uh, 10 to 40% uh, percent less IO and um, some computation, computational advantages as well because we don't need to do the connection. Um, and uh, we substitute uh, RocksDB Red Hat log. Um, that saves, saves us a lot of IO as well. Um, then for network, uh, we the, the main principle is copy data only once across zones. So here are some future works uh, we are planning to do. Um, basically, leveraging more cloud res services, for example, Cloud Lambda. Um, so uh, it's sort of like on-demand uh, computing uh, framework. So we can use that to do compaction. And uh, secondly, uh, we can use EBS snapshot functionality to do the backup, uh, and at last, um, you know, currently we we mainly use EBS. We don't use S3. Uh, S3 has like large throughput, but the performance uh, is not good. But in the in the future, if we can distinguish code data from the hot data like very accurately, we may use S3. Yep, that's it. Uh, that's our topic today. Uh, so questions. Thank you, Randy. Yeah. Uh, so anyone has any questions, I can then walk around with the mic and stop the show. Thank you, thank you. No problem. Check, check, check. There we go, it's working. Yeah. <laughs> um, so for the keeping traffic in the same AZ, if I were, say, deploying my own like, TI, KV, um, is there a way that I would need to configure that to do that? Uh, uh, no, it's uh, our work. Yeah, okay. we'll do it, yeah. So it's just aware of which uh, zone it's you, in? But uh, I think there's one word uh, you, we may need to cooperate, which okay. is to label the server, right? Okay. Yeah, gotcha. that's so it. So you yeah. tell it which zone right, the right, server's right. in, and that yeah. takes care of that. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody here? Thank you. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first is um, to uh, to reduce the heartbeats mm -hmm. um, of raft, um, those those heartbeats are for different consensus groups and they have different, for example, terms. So how does it actually work? Like who are the sender and what information does it combine together? 
and who are the receivers. I imagine that will be uh, every leader or basically every node because it must be a leader or it's very likely to be a leader of some consensus group to send everyone else. Yes, exactly. So the picture I was drawing there uh, was like from a per group perspective. Yeah, this is just one group. Yeah, the leader sends Harvey to, to his followers, right? Yeah. And uh, so what we did was just to uh, stop the heartbeat uh, process uh, if there's no like writes into this group. But if there's request, then, then we have to re resume the, the whole rough uh, process. Oh, it, it's not to piggyback a bunch of heartbeats into one message. It's more like reduce the heartbeat yeah. interval for yeah. the idle groups. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What you talk about is another optimization. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, oh, um, I think that's it. Thank you. Okay, sure. Anybody else? Uh, Derek, please. Sorry, I joined late. Joined late, but how can you describe the architecture? I mean, if I need to kind of use this in my AWS tenancy, how would I use it? I, I might have missed certain things, certain parts. Uh, yeah. So. How do you use like technically? So explain the architecture. I mean, if I need to use your service right oh, now, okay. in I my, see. you know, the tenancy, how would I use it? Uh, I think this is what you're looking for. Is this? Uh, and um, uh, like I said before, um, so uh, we're uh, being deployed on cloud using Kubernetes, uh, more, specific, more specifically Kubernetes operator pattern. Um, yeah, this is like the whole system. And by the way, we also have uh, like our own deployment tool called TIEUP, T-I-U-P. <laughs> if you want to play with it, like in your local environment, you can use that as well. But so, on cloud, we mainly use Kubernetes. Right, I would encourage you to use TIEUP. And so it will <laughs> actually even download the binary for you and copy it around everywhere and then start them all up and get them talking to each other. Yes. 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 Please. Thank you. Another one. Um, so to uh, to allow the tie flash node to fetch the data from other um, followers, um, it's pretty different from the raft protocol, where the leader sends all the messages to the followers mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in a push manner. Um, so I. I I guess the um, type flash nodes can only fetch the committed data in the learner mode. Is exactly. that how it works? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a learner. Gotcha. So yeah. for followers, they have to get the message from the uh, from the leader directly, so they cannot follow right. each other. Yeah, I mean the de de uh, implementation detail wise, there's like uh, there are like uh, many more works. <laughs> yeah, we we, also, we have some other comp like uh, internal component uh, called like a, a rough proxy, right? Yeah, yeah. That, but that's Lexi work, I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah, we, we can have a chat general, afterwards, and you can ask him all the details. Right, thank you. Yeah. So, but in sure. general, you were right. Uh, yeah. It's a learner. Yeah. Uh, good question. Anybody else? That's it. Great talk, Andy. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much for coming here. <laughs>